Welcome to session 13, The Poetical Books. Tonight we're going to dive into a little English. Oh, it sure does remind me of the days back in the fourth grade when I used to have to try and figure out what was a simile, a metaphor, a this and a that for. I'm telling you what, when you look at the poetical books of the Bible and you try and figure out how they're set up, uh, it is a little bit of a challenge. But before we get started, let's go ahead and, and uh, open up in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for bringing us together tonight, Lord. And I just ask you would bless the person watching this. Lord God, I just ask that you would bless our time together. And uh, Father, I just thank you for the blessings that you've given us. The things that we have that uh, help us to live each and every day. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray and give you all the glory. Amen. Well, tonight we're looking at the poetical books, and you'll see on the board behind me there's a whole lot of writing. We're going to look at the five poetical books and how they're set up and structured. Uh, we may not get through the whole thing in this session and might have to do a second session on this, but that's okay. Tonight we're looking at Job's, Job. Uh, Job's or Jobs, not to be confused with Jobs. It's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Those are your five poetical books in the Old Testament. Now there are various ways that they're set up. And let me share a little story with you to kind of give you some background. Because uh, there's a lot of people that uh, can write poetry. And there's some that think they can write poetry. And the author, Max Anders, has a couple of cute little stories in his book that he shares with us. Those who like poetry either think they can write it or wish they could. It's much more difficult to write enduring poetry that one imagines. However, an amateur's attempts are rarely widely appreciated. Uh, Euripides once confessed that it had taken him three days to write three verses. His astonished friend, a poet of lesser abilities, exclaimed, I could have written a hundred in that time. I believe it, replied Euripides, but they would have only lived three days. You know, King Louis the Fourteenth showed Nicholas Berlot, a French poet, of the day some poems he had written and he asked his opinion of them the great poet was also an accomplished diplomat and he replied sire nothing is impossible for your majesty for your majesty has set out to write bad verses and has succeeded you know poetry is a song of the soul Wherever great civilizations have existed, poetry has been written, and the poetry of Israel is among the finest. The Psalms of David and the Proverbs of Solomon stand up well compared with any body of poetry ever written. I dare say they probably far surpass the Weeds poem that I wrote many years ago. Someday I'll have to read that to you. Well, there are are three kinds of Old Testament books, and just a brief uh, review. You've got the historical, the poetical, and the prophetical. Remember, we have a basic overview. There are uh, five poetical books that follow the first 17 historical books, and if you remember from our sessions in the past, those five poetical books were written during the time that the 17 historical books were written. That's a, a big key uh, to keep in mind. So now to review, our historical section has come to an end. We finished that up in our last session together. The historical books are now completed, and we are moving on to the books of poetry. And uh, the poetical books, the middle five books of the Old Testament, can be located in the timeline constructed by the historical books. It's interesting to note that Job 
was written during the time of the events of the book of Genesis. That, that has always fascinated me. Because when we read the Bible, of course, Genesis being the very first book of the Bible, and after uh, 17 different books have passed, and then we're reading the book of Job, to realize that the book of Job was written during the time of Genesis, that, that just blows my mind. When I lear first learned that, I was like, what? I did not know that. And it changes so many things when you find that out. Um, Psalms during the life of David in 2 Samuel. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon were written during the lifetime of Solomon in the time covered in 1 Kings. So that will give you uh, some helpful background information when you're reading those. Remember when I was talking about David's life in 2 Samuel when he is running from Saul and he records how he feels in Psalms. You can read about those. It's pretty interesting to know that his feelings are over there. The action and what happens is in Samuel, but his feelings about what happens, uh, you can read about those in Psalm. All right, now let's look at, there's three major types of Hebrew poetry. You've got your lyric, your instructional, and your dramatic. Now if we uh, look at definition for each of those, you're going to have lyric poetry. That is usually to be accompanied by music or a, um, it's, it's like a song. You know, you'll read in Psalms, some of the subtitles will say, to the music of, or the musician played. Uh, you'll see those in Psalm on the, when you have the title of the chapter, and it'll go chapter three or four, whatever the chapter is in Psalms, and then you'll see by the musician, or played by the musician, or played to the uh, music of. So lyric, lyrical poetry. Your next one is instructional poetry. Well, instructional would be teaching. Teaching principles of living, okay, through pithy maxims, short little uh, sentences, little antidotes. And then you have dramatic poetry, a narrative that tells a story in poetic form. So your three major types of Hebrew poetry. Now, if you were to go and read uh, one of the poetry books tonight, Job or Psalms, say Psalms or even Proverbs, I would challenge you to try and figure out how they're written. Is it a lyrical psalm? Is it an instructional psalm? Is it instructing you on what to do? Is it dramatic? Is it telling a story in poetic form? And you'll look at them a whole new way when you're sitting there reading them. And if you're like me, it takes me a little bit to figure it out. Which way is this? Now, he goes a little deeper and gives us two main literary techniques. Parallelism and figures of speech. So let's look at parallelism. Things running parallel usually are matching of ideas. So the definition that he gives us is rather than matching sounds, a Hebrew poet was more concerned with matching ideas, a technique that we call parallelism. I think oftentimes we don't consider something poetry unless it rhymes. You know, roses are red, violets are blue. I'm teaching this book just to you. It rhymes. Right, And so oftentimes, creative poetry, I, I have a, a dear friend of mine who writes some of the best poetry I have ever written, and most of it does not rhyme. It, the stuff that she writes, I'm, I keep telling her, you need to publish your own poetry book because your stuff just blows my socks off. I mean, it is just so deep and intense and... Uh, I would say half the time it's over my head. She's so intellectual, uh, but it's so fascinating, this stuff. And most of it does not rhyme. She has that gift of being able to write poetry. It's just just fascinating. 
But we oftentimes have gotten used to the, the Dr. Seuss rhymes and the poets, uh, the poems that rhyme and they're fun and we remember them. And uh, I do not like, I always think of, uh, I was telling the class the other night, I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam, I am. That's the kind of poetry we got used to, right? Well, that's not uh, the only way the Hebrew poets expressed themselves back in the day. So parallelism, rather than matching the sounds, the Hebrew poet was more concerned with matching the ideas. And so they call that parallelism. So you have six common types of parallelism, okay? You have synonymous parallelism. And synonymous is that the ideas that are presented are similar. That's synonymous. So to give you an idea, make me know thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. That's Psalm 25.4. So you see the ideas presented are similar. Make me know thy ways. Teach me. Okay, you can see how those go together. So that's a, a, a um, synonymous parallelism. Synthetic parallelism is the second thought completes the first thought. So for an example, you have Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So the Lord is my shepherd being the first thought, I shall not want, that completes the first thought of the Lord being my shepherd. So that's synthetic parallelism. Now, antithetic parallelism, anytime we see the word anti, usually means that it goes uh, the opposite. It's opposite or it goes against or it's different. So antithetic parallelism would be that the second thought contrasts with the first. So for an example, you have, For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. That's Psalm 1, 6. You see the anti there. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the ways of the wicked shall perish. So you have righteous, and the anti of that is uh, wicked. Now, emblematic parallelism, this is when the first line uses a figure of speech to illustrate the idea stated in the second line. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my so my soul pants for thee, O God. And that's in Psalm 42, 1. So emblematic parallelism. It's the first line is using the figure of speech. As the deer pants for water, so my soul. And so you could see there the uh, illustration that it's making of the emblematic parallelism uh, between the deer and the soul. Now, are you lost yet? I hope not. I hope not. But this is a lot. This is a lot to look at when you're reading the Bible and you're thinking, I'm just trying to understand what it's saying. But I think if you got some of this down, it would help you uh, because some of the Bible verses, as we're seeing, can be a little confusing. Now, the fifth one is climactic parallelism. The second line repeats the first line with the exception of the last word or words. So for example, it is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine. Proverbs 31 4. So in that we have the second line repeating the first, but he's adding a word. Did you see that? It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, making a, a point, repeating the first line with the second and then adding the remainder of that. And then number six, you have formal parallelism, and that's where both lines of poetry must exist for a complete thought. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Psalm 2, 6. So you have both lines of poetry have to exist for a complete thought. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. 
Okay. All right. Now, figures of speech are ways to create visual images so that the reader can picture and imagine what's being said. The Hebrew writers wanted to um, create mental pictures that would pop into the reader's mind um, so that when they read it, they could visualize what they were talking about. And they accomplished this through figures of speech. So five of the most common figures of speech are simile. This is when I started thinking fourth grade English, when we had to try and figure out, look at the paragraph and tell the teacher what was a simile, what was a metaphor. It was confusing back then, and it's still confusing now at this age. But a simile being a comparison between two unlike things. Uh, Psalm 17, 8 says, keep me as the apple of the eye. So you can see the comparison, apple and eye, are two unlike things. Now, metaphor is a comparison in which one thing is said to be another. The Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23, 1. Hyperbole, that is a deliberate overstatement for the sake of emphasis and I think uh, some days I think there's a lot of hyperbole going on but a deliberate uh, deliberate overstatement for the sake of emphasis you know, every night I love this example that he gives in Psalm 6 6 it says every night I make my bed swim I dissolve my couch with my tears talk about hyperbole and talk about an overstatement every night I make my bed swim I dissolve my couch with my tears. Now you have a rhetorical question. We've heard that uh, oftentimes when people ask a question, they'll say, when they want an answer, they'll say, that wasn't a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is asking a question for the purpose of making a statement. So uh, his example is from Psalms 106.2. Who can speak of the mighty deeds of the Lord or can show forth all his praise. He's just asking a rhetorical question. He's not asking for anybody to respond, but he's saying, who can speak of the mighty deeds of the Lord or can show forth all his praise? And then the last one of figures of speech is personification. And that's assigning the characteristics of a human to lifeless objects. So example in Psalm 104, 19, it says, the sun knows the place of its setting. Personification, assigning the characteristics of a human to lifeless objects. The sun knows the place of its setting. And there are uh, other figures of speech that Max says, but these five are the most notable uh, in Hebrew poetry. All right. Oh, we're almost done. All righty. So let's look at Job, which was the first of the five poetical books. You have Job. And this is about suffering and God's sovereignty. Job is a very wealthy, godly man whose fortunes are suddenly and dramatically reversed. This guy loses his wealth his health, and his family, and he is plunged into profound suffering. I thought the one thing that's always fascinates me about Job is the one thing he didn't lose was his wife, and she was a nag. She even wanted him to curse God and tell him, see you later, we don't want you anymore, God, because of all the things you've taken. She was just a nag, and she didn't. he didn't lose her. Of all things, he kept the, the wife stayed around, but the book presents in dramatic poetry the internal struggles of Job and a series of debates with three friends. And they're trying to gain the proper perspective on suffering and God's sovereignty. Now, in the end, God reveals his majesty and power. And through, and though, not through, but though Job's questions are never answered, he willingly submits to the sovereignty of God. 
and his fortunes are restored and doubled. It's a pretty awesome story. It's rough in the beginning to read that the guy has lost everything but the nagging wife. Um, but to know that here is somebody that is struggling with that and can struggle with that and can have an honest conversation with God about this and that he never loses faith in the Lord. No matter what's happening, uh, he stays true to the Lord. And uh, he submits to the sovereignty of God. And as a result, his fortunes are restored and doubled. So it's a great lesson for us when things get difficult and we want to give up and curse God and tell him we don't want to follow him anymore because of the things that have happened. We need to remember we got to stay close to the Lord. We have to stay committed because he's a sovereign God. And he knows what's going on and he knows our struggles and he loves us. And although we may not understand everything, okay, we just have to trust that he knows what's happening and that we're not alone. Now looking at number two, Psalms, praise in the public worship. Psalm meaning book of praises. The book of Psalms is a collection of 150 Psalms that are divided actually into five smaller books. The Psalms are used as a book of prayer and praise in public worship in the tabernacle, temple, and synagogues back then. And today we read Psalms um, in church, at home. Uh, we pray the Psalms, we sing the Psalms. Uh, there are three primary types of Psalms. You have praise, thanksgiving, and lament. King David writes almost half of them, while several different authors uh, compile the rest. So you think of, I'm just reminded of this little uh, note about Psalms. When you think of Psalms, and there being 150 chapters in the book of Psalms, the shortest chapter, I think in, in the whole Bible, I haven't been able to find a shorter one, uh, that has two verses in it is Psalm 117. The longest chapter in the entire Bible, and I haven't been able to find a longer one, is Psalms 119. And the middle verse, and I've talked about this before, being Psalms 118.8, which says, uh, and I've I don't have the exact wording in front of me, so I'm paraphrasing Psalm 118.8. You can go and look it up, but it says, uh, don't trust man, you need to trust God. Okay, Psalm 118.8. Don't trust man, you need to trust God. So it's, it's interesting to me that the shortest chapter with two verses would be Psalms 117, and the longest would be 119. And in the middle of that, we're told, don't trust man, trust God. Okay. All right. Now, Proverbs being the third poetical book is about wisdom and skill for living. I love Proverbs. If you want to teach your kids uh, wisdom and how to live and the things they should and shouldn't do, Proverbs is a great place to start. The purpose of Proverbs is to impart wisdom or uh, skill for living. More specifically, it highlights practical wisdom discernment, self-discipline, and moral courage. It's instructional uh, poetry. And it's written in short, pithy maxims, focusing on one's relationships to God and others, money, morals, speech, industry, honesty, etc. Don't go after the, you know, the um, adulteress. Don't do this, don't do that. I mean, it's, it's short spurts of stuff. So Proverbs, you, could, you can read and gain a lot of wisdom in very few sentences, which is what I like about Proverbs. It doesn't go on and on and on and on. You can just hit it like boom, boom, boom in Proverbs, short, uh, quick thoughts, uh, nuggets of wisdom. So the message is that a life of wisdom and righteousness should preempt a life of foolishness and unrighteousness. Makes sense. Uh, Ecclesiastes, the fourth uh, poetical book, 
is a futility of temporal pursuits. Ecclesiastes is a very interesting read. Solomon, and here was a guy who had unlimited resources, opportunities. He tries to find the meaning of life through industry, pleasure, wealth, wisdom, power, and finds them all unsatisfying. Something about having 700 wives and 300 concubines just isn't getting it either. You know, it's unsatisfying. And after he reviews all of these uh, efforts and the futility of temporal pursuits, he concludes in this instructional poetry that there is only one thing that can satisfy man, and that is to fear God and keep his commandments. And that's in uh, Solomon, uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. After everything that the man has experienced and lived through, he has figured out that fearing God and keeping his commandments is the best thing that you can do for yourself. So hats off to Solomon for sharing that nugget of truth, for going through all that he lived through to tell us, give us a shortcut. Here's a shortcut for you to take. Just live for the Lord, follow his commands, and you'll be fine, right? Because you won't be alone. And then last, Song of Solomon, God's Marriage Manual. For those of you that are married, this is a great book to check out. And if you're not married, it's a great book to check out. It's God's Marriage Manual. Talk about ooey gooey, gushy. Uh, it's not my favorite. I'm just being honest. But the Song of Solomon is God's Marriage Manual. This dramatic poetry pictures the intimate love relationship between Solomon and his Shulamite bride. And in doing so, it presents God's perspective on married love. You know, in hindsight, had I read the Song of Solomon when I was married, maybe my marriage would have been better. I don't know. There's some things in there. I mean, I, I can't <laughs> I can't imagine saying, you know, things to my husband like, I'm like a deer. I'm going to go hop through the woods. Woo! -hoo, I'll be back. Oh, my love. You know, but... Maybe if I'd have done some of that, maybe it would have been a little more exciting. Maybe it would have lasted a little bit longer. Eh. Uh, I wasn't in the Bible back then, quite honest. And that's really where I needed to be. Well, five poetical books. There you go. A lot of information we covered about the types. You know, the three major types of the Hebrew poetry. The two literary techniques. We looked at uh, parallelism. We looked at figures of speech. And then we looked at a summary of each book. We went a little bit longer tonight than I normally do, but poetry is done and we're on our way to the prophetical books in the next session. So if you are um, interested in reading poetry and you haven't read those five books yet of the Bible, I would encourage you to do so. It is fun reading. Um, and you will learn a lot, especially, I, I just, Proverbs is my, is my favorite out of the five. And then Psalms, because I just love reading about David. And there's so many things about David when he's writing the Psalms, as well as some of those other writers and Psalms that I can relate to. You know, there are so many things that you read and you go, you know, there are just some days that I feel just like that dude who wrote that verse. And it's so nice to know that I'm not alone. And it's nice to be encouraged that God loves me and he knows what's going on. And he loves you too. If you don't know that, geez, I pray that you do now. He loves you. He can't help it. Well, that's our session. That's our session for tonight. Thank you for joining me. And I pray that there's been something in here that you have learned that will help you uh, enjoy reading the Bible more and uh, help you grow in your relationship with the Lord. Take care and thanks for watching. Bye.